To put it another way, what is the single best refutation of the orthodox claim to be the true church Jesus founded? Well, I hadn't encountered the writings of James Lacutus yet, but I would recommend him. Uh, James Lacutus was Orthodox. He became Catholic, and then he became the president of Catholic United for the Faith and a dear friend of 30 years. We plan to reprint his books. They're available at bookfinder.com and maybe Amazon, but bookfinder.com gives you the widest and the cheapest choices. I would also say this, that I wanted to go Orthodox. Hmm. I was drawn to the Tell us why, yeah. I mean, you don't don't have the, the Pope the stumbling block of the Pope, at least. Yeah, I mean, I was ordained a pastor, and I could be ordained as a married man, a priest in the Orthodox Church, and so I wouldn't have to commit professional suicide like I would if I became a Catholic. And so what I did was I traveled around, and I visited some Orthodox Christians, and I also visited a few Orthodox churches, and I realized very early that, um, that Orthodoxy is ethnic. There's Greek, there's Ukrainian, there is Estonian, there's Serbian, there's Russian. And, you know, I I always sort of, no, I didn't always. I had recently become suspicious of denominations, you know, and just the proliferation of denominations. And then when I realized there were more than a dozen autocephalous Orthodox bodies that are all defined by their ethnicity, I coined a term back then called denominationalism, Mm. that if there's one thing the new covenant isn't, that the old covenant was, was ethnic and nationalistic. It was Israel first. And it just struck me that when I went to a Greek Orthodox church, it was more Greek than I could be. And I felt like an outsider. And so the other thing too is the filioque. Uh, And we can't get into this, but it's one of my favorite discoveries. Yeah. uh, That if you... Just just, just for people at home, the filioque was something inserted by the church after the Council of Nicaea. That's so right. The Orthodox are right on that, but your point is that the the Orthodox are wrong to deny that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's it, right. I mean, yeah. in the seventh century and beyond, you have a semi-Arian heresy spreading in the West, mostly in Spain, that the Church in the West has to respond to, and so the Bishop of Rome does by inserting the filioque, so that the full divinity of the Holy Spirit is affirmed more explicitly. But there's also more to it than that because there was already tension between East and West and so the East didn't accept that decision and began to controvert it over the course of the next few centuries until finally in 1054 they have the mutual excommunications. And, and so more calmly and dispassionately, I went and looked at the filioque, kind of wanting to find that the Orthodox were right. But you know, by common consent, the only way we know the so-called eternal processions of the Son from the Father and the Holy Spirit from the Father mm. and through the Son or from the Father and the Son, the only way we know the eternal processions are through the temporal missions. And nobody disputes that in the temporal missions, the Father sends the mm-hmm. Son to mm-hmm. become man. And according to the farewell discourse in John 15 and 16, the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. And so if the missions reveal these eternal processions, and there's no way to know the processions I'll apart from the missions, then you know if everybody is affirming that the Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit, then how can the, fa- the Holy Spirit proceed from the Father and not from the Son? And you know there are other things too. It's one of my favorite topics, but it's so esoteric. Oh, I that love 